Um, I know many of you are, are new, but this time every year, or, or most of the time, I, I take this Sunday and take a little walk back in history about what our nation used to be. And, and this time, what, what I initially decided to do was to add some church history. Well, I dropped the church, church history because there's not enough time. And one reason I dropped the church history because it would, it would aggravate many of us. If, if I share some history, especially history that has influenced the way that we believe and, and, maybe, and speak about the, the damage that it has caused in the body of Christ. I will follow up with that at, at some point in time because it is very important that we understand when, when we, we think about the Great Awakening with, with Whitfield and Edwards and and Wesley and some of these guys and a true great awakening versus we see some things that that we have adhered to from the second great awakening uh, with people like Finney and, and I quote Finney quite often but, but some of the things that happened in the great awakening that we still want to practice today that, that really hindered hindered the gospel during that era of time. It's, it's very important, and, and I know I'm, 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 I'm constantly uh, pushing and warning about the things going on in the house of God. So, you, you know, grab it. Make the changes you need to change because at some point in time, this sermon too will pass. I don't know. I, I no longer talk about preparation. All these things, at some point, these things will pass. And we need to make sure that we grasp it now or at least look at it and consider what is it that we're missing? What is it that, that, that I'm understanding incorrectly? Because I believe until the church in America can get back on the path, then we'll never have a nation that will be the nation it used to be. Um, every Sunday, because of the, the, pre the preparation, the communication, and, and the spiritual preparation, we developed a, a, a group that gets on the ham radio every Sunday at, for the purpose of if, if there's ever any kind of disaster that we want to still be able to communicate with each other. And for the last few months, I've had so much going on here, I've had to just be out in my truck and join in the conversation through the ham radio that I have in my truck. And one thing that we always do, we open with prayer and we say the Pledge of Allegiance, and we have a huge flag out there. And, and for the past few months, every time we say the Pledge of Allegiance, as I look to the flag while, while someone is saying the pledge, my heart is broken because we're not the country that we used to be. And if there's two, for lack of a better term, I don't want to call the Bible a document, but if, if I could, just for the, the, the intent of, of making a point, there's two documents that we know very little of as Americans. One is the Bible. Two is the Constitution. And today I'm going to talk about 
some things that some of our leaders many years ago would have said and, and, and the, the deep influence that Christianity had in orchestrating or creating, formulating these documents that we still have today that we hold so dear. And to my understanding, even today, that most, if not all, state constitutions still has the, the, the concepts and precepts of God written in them. But as our founding fathers warned us, these documents in the hands of evil people are worthless. And that's where we find ourselves today is these documents, and, and we are constantly wanting to find someone that we can put in office that can fix this. Now, granted, uh, I, I, I voted for Trump over Biden. That's my privilege. It's your privilege to vote for whoever you want to. But the Christians are so desperate for someone we, we even back up and we ignore the fact that, that, that Trump, on at least two occasions that was televised, where he asked if, he'd, if he had ever asked for forgiveness to the Lord Jesus Christ, and both times he answered no, but yet we still want to label him as a Christian. He can't be a Christian if, if that still holds true. And, and the reason I'm saying this is because we are putting too much emphasis on who's in the White House or who's in Nashville. It's very important. And, and that in itself is evidence that we do not understand our form of government. We are not a democracy, nor are we just a republic. India is a republic. We are a constitutional republic. And I remember through the history, according to tradition, that whenever they, they finally had the Constitution hammered out, and as Benjamin Franklin was leaving that day, and I've shared this many, many times, there was a lady by the name of Elizabeth Powell that met him outside and she asked him, said, Mr. Franklin, what type of government have you left us with? And he said, a republic, if you can keep it. That means that it's just as much the responsibility, if not more, of the responsibility for we as citizens to be involved. And, and folks, let me tell you, the reason why, and, and I don't know, maybe it's too late. The one reason why it matters so much, if we lose this in this nation, then we'll be just like other nations, like China. It doesn't matter how, how much revival is going on in China, their government is corrupted, and it doesn't appear it's going to ever, ever change. And I don't know if we've, not all, if, if we've not already missed that boat in America, but at least, let, let, let's at least give it a try, but it's not going to work if all that we can do is just pray. And I, I'm not taking anything away from prayer. Prayer is one of the, 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 the foundations that this nation was built upon. But it wasn't just people that would pray, but it would be people that would get up and move and do something. Uh, for example, we, we would have people praying. Uh, pastors understood they need to teach their congregation the, the concepts of what Christianity was like and with an understanding that even when you walked into the civil arena, you did not leave your Christianity behind. But you, you, you hung on to your Christianity. 
Uh, today, that's a, that's a concept that's almost unheard of. I, I remember when I was in Washington, D.C., and it was either the first trip, I don't know, it might have been the last trip, but there was a lady there that, that many call her a Christian, and I don't doubt that she's not, leads a Bible study every week, according to what I was told, but would stand and vote for abortion every time. She did not understand how to transfer her Christianity, that it is who she is, and she couldn't park this. She, she fell in like many, many of them and many of us too. We, we get confused on this separation of church and state. But the Bible tells us in, in Psalms chapter 30, uh, 33, verse 12, and it's the only verse I'm going to read to you. The Bible says, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he chose for his inheritance. Now, I do want to make some clarifications here. If, if you want, no doubt, if you listen to some pastors preach, especially probably during this time of year, you're going to hear them make some statements that that we are in a covenant as a nation, that we are in a covenant with God. God made a covenant with America. God never made no such covenant with the United States of America. He didn't make a covenant with the nation of Israel. America is not Israel. There is no covenant between God and America. There is a covenant between God and His church. But there is not a covenant and don't think that because we might be in a covenant with God that somehow he's going to excuse it. There is no covenant. Matter of fact, when I look at end time prophecy, I can't even find America without trying to identify America because I read the word eagle. And that's a stretch. But if we understand who we are as citizens and somehow or another can, can uh, allow the Lord to, to burn out of us these things that are not of Him, then maybe, and, and only maybe, can we turn this nation around. I had rather see this nation turn itself around and to be neutralized than to con continue to watch us lead the world into what appears to be the platform for the last days. Not only that, we're... The, <laughs> We're going to be lucky if we don't bring Ukraine in in the next two weeks as a NATO nation so that we can put troops in Ukraine and wind up going to war with Russia. So we, it is imperative, but it has to first start with us and to learn our roles as Christians, boy, if, if I could share with you things that pastors, not only how they would share the gospel, but they had an understanding that they need to teach the whole counsel of God. It's, it's not just how we act in the church house. It's how we act in the world when we are, when we are in the civil arena. John Jay if you know your history, if you don't know your history, first of all, let me stop here. Do not let this day end without reading the Constitution. Do not do it. And the Declaration of Independence. Because the Declaration of Independence, you're going to and pay attention to the grievances that they have against Britain. 27 of them, I believe it is. Pay attention. Do not allow this day to end without reading this. The, the Declaration, the Constitution, be wise to even read our state constitution. And, and, just, and when you do this, 
And this has been one of the eye-openers for me that started about, about 17, 18 years ago. I took a class called Biblical Influence in America, and it opened the Word of God up to me in ways that I'd never seen it before. That I realized that, that you see political people all throughout the Scripture. Actually, almost every almost every book, not, uh, not every book, but I think almost every book is written either about a politician or for a politician or about a politician. So the civil arena is a big part of who we are. Our founding fathers understood this. John Jay, the first chief justice and father of the Supreme Court, one of the primary writers of the Constitution wrote, it is the duty of our Christian nation to select and prefer Christians for their rulers. Well, why would that get us in trouble today? It was the state of Delaware, along with most all the other states, which required, listen to this, whether we agree or not, but this was, you, you, you get a concept of, of their mindset, required office holders to take an oath affirming their Christian faith before they could take office. In 1782, Congress approved the use of Bible in our schools. The first school book, and I have one that's in, it's um, actually, it, it was used all the way up to the 1920s, is the New England Primer. And New England Primer, it also has John Cotton's catechisms in it. And when they would have come across, the pilgrims come across on the Mayflower, the captain would have had the Geneva Bible and John Cotton's catechism. Especially the beginning school age, these kids would learn how to read and write by reading these words from the Bible. They would learn the syllables and, and all of these just by reading scriptures and passages in the Bible. And if I had time, I would read you a letter that, that Benjamin Rush wrote in defense of using the school book, uh, the defense of using the Bible as a school book. But in 1844, when someone sued to remove the Bible from the schools, this is what the Supreme Court said. Why should not the Bible and especially the New Testament, be read and taught as a divine revelation in the schools. Where can the purest principles of morality be learned so clearly or so perfectly as from the New Testament? And you want to know who also said that? Benjamin Rush. These people who were so instrumental in establishing this nation that we call the United States of America. And I've shared this with you, but if you'll remember, even when, when we say our pledge, the pledge didn't always have under God in that. But it would have happened probably in the 50s, I think it was. As, as the president happened to be in service that day and he heard a sermon preached, and, and if I'm not mistaken, the pastor was preaching the difference between the kids that would be saying their pledge in Russia versus the, the ki children saying the pledge in America. And, and the pastor was saying the thing that's missing in Russia that we have in America is God. And they went to work immediately the next day and they, they finally added under God to our pledge. We wouldn't stand a chance having that done today. Not one, not, not any chance at all. If, if you brought some of these Jefferson and Washington and Hancock and the list goes on and on. If we could bring these back today, they'd be considered right-wing radicals 
and a threat to our nation. We've gone a long way from the roots as Americans. So I guess today it's, it's to bring a little bit of education. I mean, yeah, maybe I should be preaching a sermon from the Scripture, but I'm here to tell you, we are in a desperate and dangerous place in the United States of America, and I'm here to tell you, 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington, D.C. does not hold the key. The key is held in the church houses all across America, and they need to get back to the basics. They need to repent and come back to the cross of Jesus Christ. So, yes, I'm going to talk about our history but it's much, we, we, we need this as an example to remind us the important role that we the people have. I, I, I fear that because we don't understand how powerful the gospel is that each one of us contain, then we don't, we, we've lost sight of the power that it could have into shaping this nation once again. Our schools, our colleges, our universities have become so secular. Disregard or distance from religion. that huge chunks of information about the spiritual roots of our nation are neglected. And unless you hear from Christians, unless you hear from the pulpit, you're not going to hear it. I, I, I realize I'll take some more hits over a preaching a sermon like this, but if the, if the church is not going to teach this and preach this, where are we going to hear it at? In school? I think not. We see that America was founded by men and women who acknowledged God's supreme rule over men and over nations. These men and these women were not perfect. They were not all devout Christians, but they all acknowledged that God was supreme and that he ruled over man and then he ruled over nations. Maybe today, if you'll, if you'll take, take me up on it, read the Declaration of Independence. You were all familiar with the first part of it. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed people. In other words, they're saying we want a form of government whose job is to protect what the Creator, being God. And when you read this and you, you, you come across divine providence, they're talking about God. The Creator has given to each one of us. Then they go on to say, we therefore, the representatives of the United States of America, in general, Congress assembled appealing to the supreme justice or the supreme judge of the world. Speaking of Christ, folks, let me tell you, if they were to say that in, in our house or our Senate, I'd say we'd all pass out. because they're acknowledging that God is the supreme judge of the world. I don't know if you've ever been into the house, the U.S. Capitol. But if you're, if you're ever there, and I have been a few times, and you turn and look, and if I'm not mistaken, right 
right where the president maybe would, would walk in as he's being announced. That if you look above him, you see Moses with the law. And then the declaration ends with these words. And for the support of this declaration with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortune, and our sacred honor. I don't know if you've read it, but I've shared it several times here of how they were discussing and debating the Declaration of Independence. Because let me tell you, not everyone was on board. About 30%. Less than that were willing to fight. But these that were debating and discussing the Declaration, it was getting such a heated debate one of them finally suggested that they all stop and get on their knees. You know, I don't want to get legal about, legalist about things. Maybe sometime instead of bowing ahead, we might ought to bend a knee. And they said that to stop get on our knees and pray and seek for wisdom and guidance. John Adams, we all know who he is, wrote to his wife, we know who she is, Abigail, about the first Continental Congress, and he said, the most amazing thing occurred. Even stern old Quakers had tears gushing down their cheeks. At the sign of the Declaration of Independence, Samuel Adams, often called the father of revolution, declared, We have this day restored sovereign to whom all men ought to be obedient. He reigns in heaven, and from the rising to the setting of the sun, let his kingdom come. I, I say it this way, and I've said it for a long time, and I still stand by it. God chose Israel. America chose God. And because of that, I believe America has been protected. And I believe God directed the founding of this nation. But we have spit it back in the face of God. And now... We have almost a trillion dollars that we pour into our military. And without, and, and I would say the next two or three countries combined might equal the amount of money we spend in our military. And now today, even with this state-of-the-art Gerald Ford battleship or aircraft carrier, whichever one it is, does not stand a chance against China or Russia and their hypersonic missile. And not only that, because the leg up that we have in our Air Force, second to none, China has been they've been drafting people to come and help them build their Air Force, and American veterans have been going over there and training their soldiers. That's treason. When you think about the British Empire which during the time of the Revolutionary War, they would have been the most powerful fighting force on the face of the earth. You look at the 13 colonies, it was called a ragtag assembling of volunteers, farmers, tradesmen, who composed the ranks of the Continental Army. 
We're outmanned, outgunned, and outfinanced. See, I'm telling you, America can spend its trillion dollars, but if God is not on our side, we can't win a war against North Korea. We couldn't defeat North, we couldn't defeat Vietnam. We couldn't defeat Afghanistan. We, we, we lost it in Iraq. I guess the last time America has truly celebrated a victory, a war, would have been World War II. On August 27, 1776, 25 days after the declaration was signed, Washington's army of 8,000 found itself trapped near Brooklyn, New York. The story goes 20,000, or history says, 20,000 experienced British soldiers were poised to attack. But for some reason, they delayed their attack. Suddenly, rains came. When night fell, Washington began to evacuate his army across this mile wide river in small boats a few at a time to save as many lives as he possibly could. As morning approached, he knew that the boats would become easy targets for the British artillery. As soon as the sun rose, there, became, there was a dense fog formed where they said visibility dropped to just six yards. And the fog remained in place until the very last boat carrying Washington himself across the river. And when they were spotted, as they would try to shoot Washington out of the water, their shots would just fall short of the boat. Divine providence. These folks would write in their diary, divine providence from God. I know it's 12, and I'm going I'm try, I'm to try not to take a lot of time. But our government is also patterned after biblical principles. It, it, it's unreal. The easiest one for me to share with you is the three branches of government. I don't want you to say it. And I don't want you to nod your head, so try not to do that. But I wonder how many sitting here today knows the three branches of government. See, if you don't, then Isaiah 33 is going to mean nothing to you as an American. I mean, Isaiah 33 has a lot of meaning to us as Christians, for sure. But as an American, they should have a lot of meaning to us because that's where the idea of the three branches of government come from. And because I'm fixing to tell you, for the Lord is our judge. This is Isaiah chapter 33, beginning at verse 22. The Lord is our judge. That's the judicial our lawgiver, that's our legislative, and our king, that's our executive branch. And for the, those, those of you who believe that we have three forms of government that share equal powers, then you've been duped in believing a lie because they don't share equal powers. The branch that that wields or supposed to wield the most power is the one that has the less power today and that's the legislative branch. See, in 1973, even though our Tennessee Constitution said otherwise, and then not only that, but in 20, was it 15, that our U.S. Supreme Court declared a man can be married to a man, a woman to a woman, even though Tennessee's Constitution said marriage is defined by one man to one woman. But because our Supreme Court declared this, apparently we thought, we think they can write laws 
They cannot. There's only one branch, and that's a legislative. And that one should be the one that should wield. And, and according to our, our founders, that w is the branch that should wield the most power. The American law also guarantees our religious freedom to practice and to proclaim our faith. And I'm going to make this one really, really short. I'm not even going to, I'm not even going to share uh, what, what, what they're having to say right there. I'm, I'm just going to say this. We all understand, I hope you do, that the phrase separation of church and state is not written in our Constitution. In I guess it was either 1800 or 1801, the Danbury Baptist Association, they wrote, they wrote uh, President Jefferson a letter because they felt like their rights to worship were being given to them by government. Basically what, what, it was, what, it, what they were saying. Jefferson would have wrote them back and basically told them, no, government doesn't give you the freedom to worship. That is given by the Lord himself. In other words, what, and, and see, Jefferson didn't even coin this phrase. This, this phrase was coined some hundred years prior to that. So Jefferson would have understood, and, and as with the, Dadbury, the Danbury Baptist Association, they would have understood when Jefferson would have talked about uh, separation of church and state. They knew exactly what was meant. And when you get to 1947, 1947 Everson, Emerson versus the Board of Education in New Jersey, now, for the first time in our history, they took that statement from Jefferson and they used it to regulate the church instead of the government. Because the, the statement was always there to keep a handle on the government to restrict the government, not the people. And no one said a thing. We've allowed our heritage to be taken away from us. I, I, I went to the Supreme Court and I was listening to a lady talk about all the inscriptions and the paintings, and they're changing our history right before our very eyes in Washington, D.C. And, and folks, and I've not been up there probably in a good six or seven years now. I can't imagine how terrible it is now. America never called ourselves the exception. Other countries called us that. The exceptional. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end with this little story because I've got, and, and, and some of you have been into some of my sermons where I've talked about, it. I've got quote after quote after quote after quote after quote from our founders in, in relation to documents and how they felt about God and how this nation was, was established on the principles of the Bible. It, it's, it's unreal. I don't have time to, to discuss those, but I am going to share this story, because I don't know if I've ever shared this with you. And this was, I believe it was in 1993. There was an incident that happened 
in the former Soviet Union. Acquire from the United States was on tour in Europe. And the story goes, it was 1993 and 36 of us were over in the former Soviet Union presenting what I guess could be called an Americana concert. We dressed up in red, white, and blue, and the first night of the concert, the Yalta Concert Hall was filled with 3,000 people. We had gone through the greater part of our concert when we came to the song, America the Beautiful. We were not prepared at all for what happened. As we began to sing America the Beautiful, this crowd of people who for 70 years had been under the fist of the godless communism stood to their feet in honor of America. And we began to lose it. I mean, it got so hard for us. We were so affected that we couldn't even sing. Then another amazing thing happened. This crowd of people began to sing America the Beautiful, and we finished the song together. Church, even in our former years, America has never been perfect. But America used to be the greatest nation on earth. We can't hold claims to that any longer other than talking in the past. But the reason America has been the greatest nation on earth is because our forefathers acknowledged God and their dependence upon Him. We cannot lose sight of our heritage that Jefferson, Franklin, Rush, Hancock, Henry have entrusted to us. And do you know why the Christian world will get upset at me for taking a Sunday and preaching this? Is because we have completely fallen in line with what the world tells us what we should be saying in the church house. I would dare to say the greats in the Bible talked often about what God had done for their nation. I know they did because we can read it. I'm not going to do this every week and usually one time a year. But when we leave here today, I don't know that we shouldn't have a sense of mourning for our nation. And then just maybe, I, I don't know, but because folks, I, I can't preach you a sermon. We're not going to change the nation if we don't change the church. See, we've been trying to change a nation and we're continuing to allow the church just like we're silent about them trampling all over the Constitution. We are silent about other Christians, not the world. The world's always been evil and the world's always going to be evil. But we're allowing other Christians to trample all over the gospel. And if we're not careful, we are doing it ourselves. My goodness, if I was raised Pentecostal, so my history with Pentecostal and charismatic is, is, is much, I'm, I'm more educated in, in that than I would be the Baptist, Methodist, Wesleyan, Presbyterian, or any of those. 
And even though the, the good intentions of, of, of Pentecost, when Pentecostal churches, their, their birth in the eight, 1901, 1902, then you had Azusa Street and all these. But we have, the Pentecostal movement also has made a mockery of things today. But don't think the Baptists are any better. Folks, when we can start identifying a great move of God by how loud or how lively we are or how many people's in an altar or how loud we can sing we've lost all touch of what Christianity is all about There's only one thing that we need to be concerned with, and it's this right here. This past week, I even heard someone say that, yeah, I know the Word is good, but I need something more. And the question that I would have to ask, have you squeezed every drop of truth out of this that you can get? Have you read it so thorough that you know it through and through, not just to be able to quote it, but to understand? And the answer is no, none of us. A thousand years, if we could live that long, none of us would ever be able to squeeze every ounce of truth that, that we can find. This is all we need. We don't need anything else. This is why it's under such an attack. This is why we have prophetic words, a new thing. We have people wanting to prophesy. And then when they get it wrong, we don't even hold them accountable to what the Bible says, how we should be holding them accountable, and we continue to follow them. And I'm telling you, if you're listening to them, you're supporting them, because, especially on YouTube, because that makes a difference with their algorithms. I know you get tired of hearing me talk about this with the church. Then you just need to pray that the Lord removes me. Because I don't imagine I'm going to ever stop calling the church back. And I don't care how I was raised and how my mom and dad taught me. I'm going to stand up and, 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 and speak what I know to be truth. And folks, when I'm coming against things of the church, I'm not talking about, this. I'm talking about history. What's, what, we, what religion has done to this, we say it's a relationship, but if we're not careful, we're treating it like it's a religion. Get our hearts right. Remember what made this nation great. And if there's any hope, then it'll be found right there. If not, God have mercy on the United States of America. Let's bow.